But by God's grace, we'll dig into God's Word and talk about what it is that God wants His people to be. Not just what He wants His people to know, but what He wants us to be. I entitled this sermon today, Walking with Jesus, because it is, uh, the song has become uh, our congregational family song because of uh, Aiden. And uh, we all know Aiden loves the song and he, his eyes begin to glow when we sing it. But it's also Aiden's birthday celebration today. And the lunch is provided by his mom and dad. Well, th we're celebrating his birthday today. Am I right? No. Uh, is that is it next week? Oh, next week. So next week. But we'll have to call Walking with Jesus too next week. <laughs> I was mistaken. I thought it was today that we were going to celebrate his birthday. I guess we'll eat uh, his birthday meal next week then. But it was purposely entitled Walking with Jesus because when we talk about walking with Jesus, We take that song as a child song and take it lightly. But walking with Jesus is the entire purpose of the conversion experience in our lives. Amen. We don't just accept Jesus and put him on a shelf. We don't just compartmentalize our life and say, this is now my relationship. That relationship has to have an activity. What would happen, Jubin, if you had a relationship? I'm just saying if you had a relationship with a young lady, possible, and you declare your love for one another, and then you continue to live a life as if you don't really know her. Huh? Every now and then you pick up the phone or stop by and say, hey, how are you? And go on again. When that relationship takes place, and when that relationship has a name and it has an identity, with that identity comes an expectation that you will spend time together. You will give something of your time and your habits and your priorities to that relationship and the other person will also give some time and priorities and some habits and commitments to that relationship. And if they don't, Jubin, what happens? There is no relationship. I don't know why I'm talking to Jubin. I, maybe you guys know. When you establish and you give a name and you reach out, you either have to be a part of it actively or don't engage in that title of that relationship. It requires a daily communication, a daily walk, a transformation, a change. Not long ago, I was working with a couple. They were getting married. And uh, there were some difficulties in changing priorities and schedules and times when the young fellow was busy with his friends. And the demands on his times are such that he couldn't make time for his future wife. So as part of their assignment, I asked them to, literally I asked them, to make an appointment for a date that they would go out and spend time together. And then I used to ask them, where did you go, what did you do, and how did things go? I had to teach them how to spend time. What kind of a relationship do you have? if you don't make time for one another. It is for that reason that when I take on the name of a Christian, not differently than when you take on the name of your husband when you get married, wives, we then become beholden to a relationship. When I say that I am a Christian, that requires 
Did I set aside those things to which I was accustomed? Those habits, those priorities, those obligations, those schedules. The Bible says that when you come to Jesus Christ, the old man does what? Dies. When the old man dies and the new relationship begins, that new relationship begins with Jesus Christ. And so whatever happens, it happens in joint relationship. It happens in harmony with Jesus Christ. And it is for that reason that our life begins to transform. We begin to change the things we used to like to do before. Perhaps we don't like as much because you do not gain something without giving up something. Those of us that are in business here, there are several business people here today. Or when you go to buy something in a store. When you're going to buy something, do you just pick, pick it up and then to leave? You have to do what? You have to give something back. In every relationship, when, uh, Brother Varghese, you have dealers to whom you supply blinds. The dealers all came to your factory and picked up blinds and said, thank you very much for the window covering, and they leave. What kind of a relationship would that be? <laughs> Not a good one. No relationship that involves the police is a good relationship. <laughs> So the dealers have to come prepared to make sure that when the 30 days or 90 days, whatever your agreement is, when that time comes, the bill has got to be paid. When we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that relationship comes with the expectation that when I come, I will give up those things that are important to me if they're not important to Jesus. Galatians chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What is this talking about? The Apostle Paul in Galatians, he, st he starts out very, very strongly. Galatians chapter 1. And in chapter 3, it gets even stronger. Now he comes into a chapter where he talks about freedom in Jesus Christ. We're starting this relationship with Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. And what is that relationship? That relationship is this. That I come to Christ because when I look at God, and we've done a study in Isaiah chapter 6, when I look at God and His purity and His holiness, Isaiah looks at the angels and the angels say what? Holy, holy, holy three times and that is the maximum holiness that can exist. When I look at that God who is so holy and I look at myself like Isaiah, I say, oh wretched man that I am. I am destroyed by that holiness. And yet I have this Yearning to go back with God, but I have no way to go back with God because I am too unrighteous. And there is nothing in my life that I can do that will make me so righteous that I can be in God's presence. Is there ever a time, is there ever going to be a time that my life will be so righteous and so sinless that I can be in the presence of God? Let us say that I do no sin. I commit no sin, zero sin. I keep every commandment. I have a clean heart. I love everybody. Can I be in the presence of God? I cannot. I cannot. Look at those angels. We had this part, part of this discussion last night. Look at those angels. The highest angels in heavens are those that cover the throne of God. There is no holier created being there. And what do they do? They cover their eyes. They cover their feet. Because they don't feel worthy. 
How can I ever live a life that I can consider myself holy to be with God? I cannot. And when I see that lack of holiness, when I see my wretchedness, my sinfulness, I am chased to go to Jesus Christ because He is holy even as our Father in heaven is holy. When the Bible says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. How can I be perfect? Only way I can be perfect is if I am in Jesus Christ and I am hidden and God only sees Jesus Christ. It is in that holiness, by faith, that I become righteous. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What slavery? The slavery of trying to read and live a righteous life. Don't be slaves. Mark my words, he says. I, Paul, tell you that you let yourself be circumcised. That if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value at all. What does that mean? If you think that your works are going to make you righteous, Jesus Christ has no value. I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. If you're going to keep one law, you better be ready to keep every single little tiny iota of the law. You who are trying to be justified by the law, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly do what? Await. And what do we await? We await by faith what? Righteousness. Do you understand what that is? Do you know what that says? It says that if I try to work my righteousness, I am going the wrong way. But by faith, I must wait for the Spirit to come and transform me from the inside so the works that come out of me become righteous, not by my works, but by the righteousness of God. Not only am I saved, not only am I justified by Jesus Christ, not only am I justified by His grace, I am also sanctified by His strength. It is He who changes us. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await. And by the way, we don't command, demand, request the Holy Spirit to please come. We wait. We wait. That was the command that Jesus gave. Just go and wait. As long as you are committed, as long as you have given your heart, then that spirit will change. It is for this reason that Jesus constantly said that it is not from the outside that you cleanse. It is from the inside out. But what happens to me? Even when others may think that I'm okay, when I who know my heart and I who know my own secrets, when I stand before God, I know, I know how righteous I am not. All the works on the outside, I can preach the law, I can teach the law, I can out-debate you. But if the Spirit of God is not in me, my righteous works are worthless. You were running a good race, chapter, verse 7. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? The, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. If you have been called away, and now somebody is trying to tell you that you have to earn your righteousness, A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. What does it mean? It spoils your righteousness. It spoils your salvation. 
I am confident in the Lord. Now you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. I'm going to skip a few verses and go to verse 16. Because that is the heart of the message in verse 16. So I say, do what? Do what? Walk. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Don't jump. Don't do high jumps. Don't run. A daily, slow, comfortable walk in the Spirit. Not that's going to cause you to sweat. Not that's going to cause you to, uh, uh, your heart to go crazy. Not that it's going to cause you to go absolutely nuts and worried. But walk gently. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. What does that mean? By nature, we all love sin. If anybody says that in our natural self we don't love sin, we're liars. That's not me saying it, the Bible says it. We're liars. And what kind of sin? You pick it. You pick your own sin. If I was to ask you to make a private list of your favorite sins, <laughs> ah, is there anybody that wouldn't have it? In the flesh we all not like, we love sin. You know why we love sin? Because that is our nature. That is what we do. I don't know if you saw the news the other day. There was a bear. One in Buffalo and one in uh, Port Perry, I think. Poor little bear got stuck in a tree. The firemen, people went there to get it down. They were able to get it down safely. And they were saying on the radio and on the news, you know, they said, now, we see bears in cartoons, and we see they're so cute and cuddly and friendly and nice. But a bear this time of year, especially if there's a bear who has little babies, will tear you apart. Why? Because that is the nature of the bear. We are by nature born in sin, and we like sin. Terrible thing for me to say, isn't it? That sin could be selfishness. It could be... And that's, a, that's the worst of it. The, the, the selfishness. It could be greed. It could be pride. But we like it. But there is a conflict with the Spirit of God that is in us. And the flesh of what we are made. That's why the Apostle Paul says, That which I want to do by the Spirit of God, I can't do. And that I don't want to do, I do it. That's why we suffer. And then it says, verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Then he makes a whole list. And verse 22 that was cited earlier during our Sabbath school time. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I ask you. If I was to say that in my private life, even when I'm in the car by myself, do I see these things in my life? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I don't. I don't. Because the Spirit is still working. The Spirit is working, trying to transform us. 
And when we look at this kind of a list in our lives, it chases us to go to Jesus Christ, that He may represent me and bring me before God and transform me. So we are justified immediately and sanctification and the changing of our hearts starts immediately by the Spirit of God. But that walking takes time. It takes time. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And there, get verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, and that is as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified by If I rely on the law, and if I say that according to the law, I keep the law, can I be justified before God? The Bible tells me no. I cannot be. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to 1 John. Chapter 1. And there, verse 8. This is not the Gospel of John. This is the book of 1 John. Toward the end before Revelation. Verse 8. If we claim to be without sin. We do what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a what? Liar and His word is not. not possible for me to try to transform my life to become righteous before God. It is not possible. There has never been a human like it except Jesus Christ. And it is only through Jesus Christ that we find salvation. We find justification. We were in sin. We died in sin. And sin has two components. One component is the actions of sin, and the other component is the condition of sin. And irrespective of my actions, where my actions may mimic, pretend to be righteous, my condition and my heart is still sin. It is for that reason that we find righteousness and unity and redemption and atonement with God in only one way. That is through faith and acceptance of Jesus Christ and His righteousness as our righteousness. And then let God, allow God to walk with us day by day by day to transform us to the extent that those things that are inside of me begin to change. When Isaiah says, I'm a man of sinful lips and I live among the people of sinful lips, what he means by that is everything that comes out of his mouth represents sin that's in his heart. We are transformed not by our efforts, it was not Isaiah who picked up the coal and touched his lips with it. It was the messenger of God who had to pick up the coal and touch him with it. It is the power of God that justifies us. It is the power of God that sanctifies us. 
and makes us fit to be in the presence of God. As sinful beings, we can only hope to be with God without Jesus Christ. The only way that we can be redeemed and get back to where God wanted us to be with Him is through faith to be justified and then wait for the Spirit of God to make us righteous. That when God is dealing with you and I, He sees that we are fit to be with Him. Not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus Christ is.